the Lord open my lips. Make haste, O oh God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O oh Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Praise to you, O Christ, Lamb of our salvation. declare the glory of God. Day to day pours out speech. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their measuring line goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them. <coughs> the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. 
Moreover, by them is your servant warned. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. <coughs> Our first reading this evening is from the book of Acts, beginning in the 12th chapter in the first verse, but after the 7th verse, holding off to pick up again again at the 18th verse. About that time, Herod, the king, laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of the unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison. But earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now when Herod was about to bring him out on the very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, on sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up, quickly! And the chains fell off his hands. Now when day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries in order that they should be put to death. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. And they came to him with one accord, and having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace, because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, The voice of a god and not of a man. Immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down, because he did not give God the glory, and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. But the word of God increased and multiplied. O Lord, have mercy upon us. God. Our second reading is from the Gospel according to St. Luke, the 13th chapter, beginning with the 31st verse. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to Jesus, Get away from here! For Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, Go and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow. And the third day I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following. For it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under his wings? But you are not willing. Behold, your house is forsaken, and I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Deliver me, O Lord, my God, for you are the God of my salvation. In you, O Lord, do I put my trust. Leave me not, O Lord, my God. Deliver me, O Lord, my God, for you are the God of my salvation. May the meditations of our hearts and the words of my lips be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Our text is from the Gospel. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you are not willing. <coughs> now, in whodunit stories, there is often an initial suspect, somebody who has shown from the very beginning of the story antagonism towards the victim. And so when something bad happens to the victim, you think, oh, it's got to be this person who's established that they don't like the person who is the victim. And normally, when you've got that prime suspect, the story will swerve very early. And you'll think that you know who's going to do it, but something rules that prime suspect out. And so you start going through the next subject and the next after that. And then one of these good stories knows how to swerve again so that about about the climax you find out, oh wait, all the evidence you used to rule out the prime suspect, for some reason it was bad evidence, you've overlooked another clue, and the prime suspect is back on the board again. Now that doesn't mean there won't be six or seven more twists after that, and the prime suspect won't necessarily be the one who did it, but it makes for exciting end of the, the story whodunits. 
Now, in Agatha Christie classic, Death on the Nile, we suspect Jacqueline from the very beginning. Jacqueline wants to murder her rival, Lynette Ridgway. And the sensitive detective, Hercule Poirot, even has a heart-to-heart -heart with Jacqueline, kind of senses the path she's on and tells her, you don't want to go down this path. Don't do it, Jacqueline. But before Lynette is murdered, there is a dramatic and surprising scene where Jacqueline shoots not Lynette, but another person in the leg. She shoots her old lover in the leg and feels bad about it, kicks the gun away, is taken off and kept in a room where all night somebody's watching over her and we know she doesn't have that gun anymore and so she's got an ironclad alibi when that gun is used by the hand of somebody else to murder Lynette. Well, Jacqueline has been ruled out for much of the book. I won't tell you what happens as we get a little further in the book, just in case there's somebody who hasn't had a chance to read it yet. Well, the Herods of the Bible are like that. They are the prime suspect. Everybody thinks that if there's going to be a murder of the Christ, it's going to be a Herod who accomplishes it. And that's what they say to Jesus in our reading. Herod is going to get you, Jesus, if you don't watch out. And... It was Herod the Great who, in fact, did try to murder Jesus when he was born. And the wise men show up and they say, we're here to see the king of Israel. And Herod says, yeah, it's me. And they're like, no, 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 not you. We've got this other king of Israel. And Herod says, oh, yeah, tell me more. Tell me more. I'm going to go find that guy and give him the respect I think he's due. Well, the Magi and Joseph figure it out thanks to an angel in a dream, and Jesus is scurried away off to Egypt so that he'll be able to come back and do his ministry before he does die on the cross. But Herod is not content. He slaughters the entire Bethlehem village, all of the infants that were there, in order to hope that he would sweep up the Messiah in the midst of all of those infants that he was willing to kill. So we know Herod the Great is capable of murder. One of the things as you're reading through the Bible can be hard to keep track of is that there are actually three Herods. I hope you're going to be able to bear with me as we go through this. But it's actually helpful to, to kind of untangle them. Because there's Herod the Great, who was the first Herod. He's the first king. And he's the one who establishes that throne. But he dies about two to four years after Jesus' birth. So he is, most of his time is before Jesus' birth, in that last century before the birth of Christ. Uh, Herod's father was good friends with Julius Caesar. Herod himself was good friends with Mark Antony. And so those connections helped them establish their power in Judea. When the Parthen, uh, excuse me, when the Parthians invaded Palestine, I'll try and say that one three times fast, uh, the Roman Senate said, oh, well, we'll declare Herod king, so that gives him legal cover, and here, Herod, here's an army. You just get rid of the Parthians for us. And so he did. He defeated the Parthians, and he was able to have three decades of comfortable rule in Judea. Uh, but he did die after Jesus' birth, and that's when Joseph brings Jesus back to the Holy Land and moves them up to Nazareth. And when he died... Instead of giving his kingdom over to just one of his descendants, he gave it over in quadrants to four of his descendants. And so the next Herod we know, Herod Antipas, he was called a Tetrarch. And so he had one quarter of it. He had the Galilean area where Jesus did much of his ministry. And so Herod Antipas is the one who killed John the Baptist because John told him that he was wrong for taking his brother's wife, Salome, and therefore we end up with, um, we end up with John beheaded after the dance, right? So Herod is warned then that just as Herod, excuse me, Jesus is warned that just as Herod killed John, his cousin, he's going to get Jesus too. Now that's... Herod Antipas. There's one more Herod, who's the Herod in our reading from Acts, and that's Herod Agrippa. Now, Herod Agrippa's father was killed by Herod the Great. 
So the family business was killing, and they kept it in the family. <laughs> so Herod, was, Herod the Great, the first Herod, was so paranoid that people were going to take his throne that he was convinced by somebody who was trying to poison him against his favorite wife to have not only his wife killed, but two of her sons killed. And he goes through her whole family. He kills his wife, two of her sons, his, her uh, mother, her grandfather, uncle, and... That's why Herod Agrippa took off, did not stay in Judea, went to Rome, and did what a good Herod does in Rome. He made connections, and he said, I'm going to get back that power that was taken from my line of the Herod family. So Herod Agrippa is in Rome while Herod Antipas is doing his thing back in Judea, and Herod Agrippa is gathering more and more famous, powerful Roman friends. When Herod Antipas hears about it, he tries to do what a good Herod would do, a knife Herod Agrippa in the back, this time not literally, just politically, and he's not able to succeed. So Herod Antipas ends up ending his days in exile, and Herod Agrippa marches back into Jerusalem, the conquering Herod hero, able to take over not just one of the tetrarchies, but he was so politically adept, he took all four back, and good for Herod Agrippa, except we saw what happened at the end of Herod Agrippa's life. He didn't give the glory to God, and there was somebody who he did not see coming who struck him down. The angel of the Lord struck Herod Agrippa down, and that was the end of the Herodian dynasty. I just gave you the whole Herodian dynasty history, just three guys. They went up, looked great, and then they were gone before we get out of that first century. So Agrippa also proved that he was capable of doing the murder thing like all of the other Herods. We read that he killed the Apostle James. He wanted to kill the Apostle Peter. Um, <coughs> and so we look at this. This is the prime suspect. If anybody's going to kill somebody who's being called the son of David, the king of Israel, it's going to be a Herod. Well, what happens when Jesus comes face to face with one of the Herods, Herod Antipas. Luke 23 tells us. So remember, Jesus is brought into trial into Pilate. And Pilate really doesn't want to have anything to do with this trial. He's not interested in getting in between of what he sees as just a fight between Jesus and his followers and the scribes and the Pharisees and who wants to get involved in all that mess. And he knows that Herod Antipas is in town for the Passover. So he says, hey, Herod, you know, you and I haven't always had... You know, had been on the same page. Maybe this will make you happy. In fact, it did make him happy. They became friends, Pilate and Herod, after this. He sends Jesus over to Herod, and Herod Onipos is like, this is great. I've been wanting to see this guy ever since I lost my other favorite prophet, John, who I had to, you know, behead. I, even, I liked having in prison, but maybe this will be my new replacement prophet, Jesus. So he's trying to question Jesus. Jesus, do a miracle for me. Answer questions for me. Come on, tell me what you think about my marriage. Come on, Jesus, say something. He keeps poking and prodding Jesus, and what does Jesus do? Well, Jesus knows that he's in that last period of his ministry, that Isaiah 53 period where he's got nothing to say. He's just there to be the suffering servant. And so Jesus doesn't say a thing. This is the time when they dress Jesus mockingly in the robes of royalty in Herod's palace. And they say, oh yeah, Jesus, we'll dress you in purple, we'll bow down to you and treat you like you're a king. Well, it was clear that Herod did not have any respect for Jesus. And we talked about what the motives of the Herods might be. Well, the Herods killed the people they saw as rivals. And so when he looks at Jesus in the eye, and Jesus is not playing the game he's playing, he realizes immediately this is not a rival. So he doesn't have a motive to kill Jesus. He just mocks him and sends him back to Pilate. Well, this is the thing. that The Herods knew how to be earthly kings, right? They schemed. They backstabbed. They built big monuments. They lived in luxury. They tried to win favor to secure their position so that they could give favors to others who will make them happy. That was the game they played. And they looked at Jesus. That was not what he was playing. That was not what he was doing. They knew he was not going to be their rival because Jesus' throne is not one to dominate ruthlessly, not one to collect favor and paid for allies, not one to puff up the ego to the point of trying to take God's own glory. Jesus let go the glory and the power of divinity. 
He refused to use that glory and power for his own benefit. He served his people being humiliated, being condemned, being crucified. That's the picture that we heard when he speaks to Herod, that fox. If Herod's the fox who wants to come, Jesus isn't going to hide from him. He'll be the hen who puts the chicks under his wings, that takes the attacks of the fox, who's willing to suffer to protect his people. The Father above, they, he looked at Jesus, fulfilling that role of the King of Israel, the one who was willing to suffer to be protector. And he says, that is the true King of Israel. That is my beloved Son. And so the Father accepted Jesus' sacrifice on the cross and raised him up. Raised Jesus not just from the grave, but enthroned him in heaven forever. Now Jesus has the glory that he had let loose, given back to him eternally. And he has it not to hoard for himself, but to share with all of his brothers and sisters. When Israel first asked the prophet Samuel, he said, Samuel, we don't want to be ruled by judges anymore. Give us a king. Samuel warned them. He said, you think that if you get a king, he'll fight for you. He'll be a mighty warrior on your behalf. But that's not what kings do. When kings are given that power, they take the cream off the top. They take all the best things for themselves. They hoard those best things in their palaces, and they don't share for them. And of course, Samuel's words were proven true, not just for Israel, but for nation after nation throughout history. Except for one, right? The one who was not a rival of the kings of this earth. The one who is king of kings. The king who really does fight for us taking our wounds in our place. The one who knows to fight our biggest enemies, not just the others that we might see as rivals down here on earth, but to fight against sin, against death, and the devil. Instead of taking our goods, child, and wife, Jesus stands beside us on the plane. He fights for us. He gives his best to us. He gives himself to us. So we say all praise to the one true king, the only God-man, Jesus, our Lord, the Son of David. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We rise to sing the Magnificat.
We rise to pray. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now we turn to 249 for the litany. In peace let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. For Matthew and Richard, for all pastors in Christ, for all servants of the church, and for all the people, let us pray to the Lord. For Joseph, for all public servants, for the government and those who protect us, that they may be upheld and strengthened in every good deed, let us pray to the Lord. For those who work to bring peace, justice, health, and protection in this and every place, let us pray to the Lord. For those who bring offerings, those who do good works in this congregation, those who toil, those who sing, and all the people here present who await from the Lord great and abundant mercy, let us pray to the Lord. For favorable weather, for an abundance of the fruits of the earth, and for peaceful times, let us pray to the Lord. For our deliverance from all affliction, wrath, danger, and need, let us pray to the Lord. For the faithful who have gone before us and are with Christ, let us give thanks to the Lord. O God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us bless the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. the 
grave as little as my bed. Teach me to die that so I may rise glorious at the awful day. <coughs> my soul in thee repose and may sweet sleep mine eyelids close. Sleep that shall me more vigorous make to serve my God when I awake. When in the night I sleepless lie, my soul with heavenly thoughts supply. Let no ill dreams disturb my rest. No powers of darkness me molest. Praise God from whom all creatures flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The congregation may be seated. Just a brief announcement here. Um, next week, we will only be having the 7 p.m. service for the uh, Vespers. Um, we'll have dinner at the normal time, but then we will be back to the 5 o'clock and 7 o'clock the following week. So next week, just a brief uh, suspension of the 5 o'clock service, only one service here at 7 o'clock. God's blessings on your week.